Hi, Mary Lou here. What's up with sublimation? It's kind of all the craze in the crafting world, but sublimation is a scientific process that I studied back when I was in elementary school. My bachelor's degree is in science and I have a master's in math education. And so my mind always goes to that, hmm, why do things work the way they do and what is up? So today we are talking about the science of sublimation and I have several experiments lined up here on my back counter that we're going to do. I have several questions about how does that natural process of sublimation happen on the craft table so we're going to do several projects, several experiments today, and then I'm also going to talk about sublimation printers. I have looked at so many and investigated so many, and I'm going to tell you the one that I am going to buy at some point when I buy a sublimation printer and why I would go ahead and get a printer rather, rather than just buying infusible ink. And if you'll stay to the end, I'll tell you one of the craziest things I've ever done in a laboratory as part of an experiment. Okay, so let's get started about sublimation. What is it? So I investigated basic sublimation uh, back near the end of last year, and I have some videos about that where I am actually uh, doing sublimation with a household iron, and you could look back at those. Today, I have a heat press that I got for Christmas that I'm gonna be using because it's larger in the base, it's a solid base, and it has more consistent heat. So what is sublimation? Sublimation is actually a process where a solid goes into a gas without ever passing through a liquid phase. So what we normally think of, the snow falls, uh, the sun comes out, it melts, and then it evaporates. Well, sublimation is when it goes straight to evaporation without ever becoming a liquid. So it's going straight from solid into a gas. And it's a natural process that happens all the time. Uh, if you burn logs in a fireplace, uh, they burn, the, the process of combustion creates smoke, and it goes up the chimney and deposits as chimney creosote. So there, it's a gas as it comes up the chimney from combustion, but it deposits straight onto the chimney as creosote. That is sublimation. Also, if you've ever seen dry ice and you set it on the counter and it's there kind of smoking, you are watching sublimation. And so in the crafting world, sublimation has kind of become all the rage and, and you can sublimate on different substrates. So a substrate is a material that you are putting something onto or into. And so my question is, can you sublimate onto wood? What about glass, tile? Uh, a month or two ago, I tried 100% cotton and uh, it didn't come out as well. But what about an 80-20 blend or a 60-40 blend? What about satin or uh, some other lightweight uh, fabrics? So we're going to experiment with all kinds of things. Right now, the only uh, means I have to sublimate is to buy infusible ink. So I'm just going to show you, it's basically uh, ink in a solid form that is put on a plastic backing, and then you can cut it with a Cricut machine or with your scissors or whatever. And then when you heat it, it goes from that solid state at, into a gas and then uh, embeds into your substrate. Another question I have is, once you've sublimated, can you sublimate again on the same substrate? So we're going to uh, go through and figure all of those things out. So we're going to start with several different substrates, okay? So I have here an infusible bookmark. If you've watched my channel, you've seen me do uh, sublimation on that. So I've got wood, and then I've got a piece of tile, 
and then I also have a piece of glass. And we're actually going to try all of these projects and see how the sublimation works on each of these. So the first thing to keep in mind always is that the ink side of the infusible paper always goes right down onto your, your substrate or your blank. And then we use heat resistant tape to hold things in place so that they don't move around because if your items move around while you are sublimating, you will get some interesting ghosting going on um, so that your images are not particularly clear. Now, if you watched my older videos, you, see, you would see me actually flip them over and sublimate both sides. I have since learned that really is not necessary. We're going to put ink side up once we have those down. All right, so we have those. I'm going to have to do the tile separately because it's so thick. I'm thinking I'll save the glass too and do that separately because what I want is for these items that for them to actually sit really flat. Now, infusible ink can get on my nice pad. I don't want to ruin that. So I'm just going to really give myself some good layers of protection. So I'm actually going to pick up the heat press and go straight down on those blanks and give it some pressure. Okay, now I'm just gonna lift that straight up and then I want these to cool. So I'm going to set these over on my counter back here. And so let's go ahead and try the tile. I just printed out the word friends. Okay, so the tile is done. And then let's do our last one. I've got a piece of just clear glass. Okay, so now the glass is done. Let's move those over. I, I goofed. I made a goof on a mug that I did. I forgot to mirror image it. This was a mug for Hanukkah. I forgot to mirror image it. And so it's a mistake. So what I'm going to, to try today is to see if you can sublimate over something that has already been sublimated. So that's our next experiment. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to use this uh, mat that I have down here. And I have a set of tools that I've used for years that I really like. And I've got some that have different sizes of holes. I am just going to put just some holes in here because I actually do want to see how it comes out in comparison to the blue that's already there. So this is just gonna give me a, sort of a base uh, to, uh, for comparison. There, uh, we'll be able to see the blue that's on there if it gets covered. If not, uh, we're gonna be able to see, and it'll be interesting because that blue is very dark. So I'm gonna go ahead and get my heat resistant tape and use that and I want it nice and tight around that mug. Okay, there we go. And I want it to sit very flat so it comes down to the bottom of the mug. And I also want to protect my mug press and not get any ink staining in there. So I'm gonna just grab another sheet of the butcher paper and put that down. Okay, and our mug press is ready. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there and try to keep this centered as I close that lid. There we go. And now it'll start the countdown. Now let's see how our experiments turned out. Okay, so this one, it's nice and cool. This one we know uh, will sublimate because you know, it's your typical sublimation blank tape up. Okay, now let's see. Oh, well, that's really fun. 
And, and look how it even sublimated onto the tape. I think that's interesting. So that's a good reason to keep make sure you keep your tape out of the way. But that's, so we know we can sublimate onto tape. There is one thing, I, I really like that. That is super fun. That's a, that's a bookmark. This might not be quite the right color, but I'm gonna just put this through here because this is how these work. And then you put this into the book and this hangs over the spine of the book. So this is up. So we know that sublimates well because that is a sublimation blank. Now I'm super curious about the wood. And honestly, I don't know. And I see it did sublimate. Oh, okay. Can you see... There's just the slightest little imprint. This was the infusible ink sheet for the bookmark. Look at this. Most of the ink is still sitting right there. So sublimation on wood, not successful. Now, if the wood didn't, that makes me think that perhaps the other things didn't either. Okay, so let's see, use it for something else. Okay, so I'm seeing that most of the ink is still right there on that. And I don't know if you can see that little ghost of the word friends. So tile, no. And so then that tells me that, that probably glass will be the same. Oh, and this surprises me. I honestly did not know what was going to happen. But this one surprises me that of the three weird materials, I, that, I think that's hard to see, that one actually did the best. It's just very, very light. So not successful. All right, our next series of projects are going to involve 100% cotton, an 80-20 blend that's actually furry. I was really curious about whether you could do a furry fabric and then we've got a 60-40 blend and then a couple of really weird random fabrics. So we're going to try those all. Okay, so this is 100% cotton. So my daughter, the first language she spoke was actually sign language. And so I wanted to do this shirt for her. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put down my protective sheets. Okay. okay, Okay. so the next thing we're testing, we're just going to have a little rose just off to the side there. I don't know. We shall see. Here we go. Okay, so this is the 6040. So I'm doing this down the sleeve a little vine pattern that I found in Cricut Design Space. So what I did is I duplicated it three times, flipped one of them, and then just kind of joined the vine up so it was sort of an undulating vine. And then I welded it so that none of the splits would be cut uh, when I when it went through the Cricut. And make sure you, ha you check your heat guide to find out uh, what you need to do depending on what your substrate is. So we're putting everything over here to cool. Now, to be honest, I'm a little nervous about these. This is a, a satin uh, fabric that is polyester, so it's not true satin. And so I'm going to try that one. And then I've got an even, even lighter piece that's sort of like chiffon. I'm just putting a trial piece down. These are just scraps and I, I'm not gonna use them for anything. This is just for experiment, of course. That's what we're all about today, the science of sublimation. And those are all cooling really nicely over there. Okay, here we go. I'm not going to put any pressure on this one because that fabric is so light and delicate. Okay. We're just working through all of these and we'll just see how that goes. All right, this is cool enough that we can now 
take this off. I use this weeding tool from the dollar store because I don't like it for weeding, but it is really great to use uh, for getting under tape. So I really do like that. So that's the one. I want to keep my, my really good weeders for other things. This is going to be interesting, I think. Okay, so let's get that outer piece off. And then we'll get this tape up. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh, this is hilarious. Okay. Um, here's the thing. Look at that. Now this, I don't know if you can see that on camera, but those little circles look almost like little stars in a dark sky. The, the transfer came across in the white part of the uh, mug. The transfer paper had sort of an ombre uh, thing going on. And so it did transfer to where it was white and you can see it here. So, but this I think is so interesting how that came out. That would be a way to maybe do an interesting effect. So this is my conclusion with this is, if you've got a dark color like this, the ability to resublimate, not very good, although maybe you could create some interesting effects, but the rest of it, it will only resublimate in an area where you've either got a white or a light color. So that was a good experiment. Hey, and it's still a mug. I mean, you know, we can still drink out of that. Okay, let's see how the 100% cotton transferred. I'm really interested in this one. Oh, uh, there's no ink left. So it did transfer and it's very light, but it did work, but not very dark. Now, if I had used white, I think that would have transferred even better. But actually, I kind of like how subtle that is. So that spells out love. And so I thought that was, so so not bad. Probably not the best, but not bad. Uh, one of these upcoming days, I tell you what I'll do. I'll find out about the spray or whatever that you can use and we'll try that on several different um, substrates and see how that goes. Let's see how this came out. I was really curious about this. I do see that the scrunchy stuff did get kind of pushed down and it's not really coming up uh, again. Okay, but how about our transfer? Uh, not at all. That did not transfer at all. Now remember this was 80% polyester, 20% cotton. And I'm not seeing any of the ink left, although some of the red bled onto here. Not successful at all. Hmm, interesting. Isn't this good to know? So you don't waste your time. Now we know. Okay, let's see how our vine transfer went on our sleeve. Now, this one was, 60% cotton, 40% polyester. So let's just pull that up. Oh, now that transferred. So pretty much all of the ink gone on the transfer sheet. And that actually did transfer very nicely. Now I'm really interested in how this comes out. Oh, oh. Look at that. Now these are largely polyester. So that actually, that actually came out pretty well. This is the chiffon, very light, very airy. I mean, you can, you can see through it. And then this is the satin. I guess it would be sateen because it's polyester. And I do see ink left on those, but it's very um, grayed down. Compared to that one, I mean, that substrate took all of the ink and these didn't. So it is successful, but 
Uh, maybe minimally so. The heat guide doesn't say anything about sateen, chiffon, any of these lightweight fabrics. I guess they're not expecting us to sublimate on them, uh, you know, but of course I'm gonna do it just to try it. Now, let me show you the difference between a sublimated shirt and an iron-on or HTV. This is something I did uh, last week for uh, one of my Valentine's Day's videos. This is iron-on or HTV. Now, I don't know if you can tell, but where the iron-on is, that fabric does not stretch. It will stretch between letters, but it will not stretch where the iron-on is. But look at the infused one. It is actually embedded in the fabric and you can still stretch it all the directions. And it doesn't ruin it, it just goes back, you know, with the spring of the fabric. That is the big difference between HTV and infusible ink. This one, uh, with my eyes closed, I cannot tell at all where the print is because it's actually embedded, sublimated, into the fabric, whereas this is actually just sitting on top. And after several washes, this actually has a, a good chance of coming off. But this, the only way to get rid of that is to cut it out, wear it out. That is embedded into the fibers of the cloth. So that's one of the big differences between infusible ink and sublimation versus iron-on or heat transfer vinyl. I hope all of those experiments help you understand a little better how that sublimation happens, what substrates are good, what which are not. And so what we actually found out, the very best is a substrate that actually is created for sublimation. Okay, so now let's talk about why I'm interested in a sublimation printer. So the infusible inks, they are more expensive than a roll of vinyl. So most of these run right around $14, $15. Some of them that are uh, have really pretty patterns, they are up to $17 and $18. And so it becomes pretty expensive. So one of the reasons I would like to get a sublimation printer is for that reason. With a sublimation printer, you just print on sublimation paper. You can't print on just copy paper. You, it has to be sublimation uh, paper. And that's a lot less expensive than buying the infusible inks. So that's the first reason. The other reason I would like to have a sublimation printer is because I want to create my own designs. I want to be able to go in and make everything exactly how I want it, then print it onto the paper and apply it to my project. I want the creativity that comes with creating my own designs. I have seen some beautiful designs that people have made and then they put it on the sublimation paper and then it's onto their substrate or their blank and it ends up absolutely gorgeous. So I want the freedom to be able to do that. So let's talk about what printer. There are several out there. I made a list of sublimation printers and there are over 20. That are, that are listed as sublimation printers. So I went through those and I realized that I could very quickly throw out of my investigation about five of them. Rico brand is now Epson. And those Rico printers that were being used for sublimation are no longer available unless you buy them used repurposed at a yard sale. So it really comes down to two brands of printers for sublimation. There's a sawgrass printer and there's an Epson Echo Tank. And the only Epson printers that work for sublimation are the Echo Tank. You don't ever want to run regular ink through that printer if you're going to use it for sublimation. If you have a printer you want to convert to sublimation, it actually is a very involved process. You have to clean the ports where the ink goes. You have to clean the machine. Then you put in the sublimation ink and you print, print, print until all of the old ink is out of the system, out of the lines, 
then it takes on sublimation ink. And who knows how many copies you're gonna to have to do before it actually becomes a sublimation printer. And you've gotta use up a good deal of sublimation ink while you're getting it converted. So most people, the manufacturers, they do not recommend that you take an existing printer and switch it over to sublimation. And the only ones you can do that on are the echo tanks where you actually see the tank and you're putting your, your ink in there. There is a brother uh, printer. I don't know if, uh, I don't even know where you would find it now. It only prints black and white. It does sublimation, but only in black and white. So I just didn't even consider that because I want all the pretty colors that are part of why I want to sublimate. And so it comes down to the sawgrass printer and the echo tank printers. And there are several versions of the echo tank. The sawgrass printer, the 500, that prints a standard page, those run from about $575 right now up to $625, $650. Now, if you want to print a larger print, I'm talking like a 13 by 21, you have to get the larger printer. The one caveat to that is that now Sawgrass sells an attachment that you can put onto the back of either of the Sawgrass printers and it will allow you to feed in larger paper so you can do a bigger print. The uh, Epson Echo Tanks, uh, the ones that will print a, a basically a nine by 14, you're looking at the Epson Workforce, the 7700 series, um, if you want to do the really big size, then you're looking at the Epson Echo Tank 15,000, and they do very large prints. And price-wise, the Echo Tanks start right around uh, 250, and the 15,000 currently is right around $600. And so, if you're looking at the Sawgrass 500 that does the smaller prints compared to the Echo Tank 15,000 that does the larger print, the, the price is very comparable. Now let me tell you what the decision maker was for me. Because even with your regular inkjet printer, really the cost comes in replacement cartridges, in new ink. And so that's where the Sawgrass and the Epson start to really uh, divide in cost. So the Sawgrass, ink cartridges, I was hard pressed to find any one cartridge of any one color uh, less than $80. So one color, $80. And so for the Epson, I looked at replacement ink and generally you can buy the whole set of replacement ink, all four colors, black, cyan, magenta, and yellow, you can buy that whole set for around $40. And so the replacement ink really for me is what becomes really the decision maker uh, based on finances. To get your first set of sublimation ink, you're going to have to buy it separate because your Epson is going to come with regular inkjet ink and you cannot run that in that printer. In fact, the recommendation is don't even plug the printer in until you have the sublimation ink in it. And so uh, there is this to remember. Once you convert it to sublimation, meaning you've put in sublimation ink rather than inkjet ink, it actually voids the manufacturer's warranty. So you'll have to weigh that in the cost. The other advantage to the Sawgrass is it actually has a design software that goes with it if you want to work inside the software of the printer. Uh, the Epson, you would use whatever print software you have and, and then, you know, print that way. They both make beautiful prints. I have watched people uh, do su sublimation from both printers and they both do a beautiful job. There's the thing, you've got to look at cost, cost of replacement uh, ink. If you're looking at the Sawgrass 1000 that already is able to do pages up to 13 by 19, 
those are starting at $1,500. So then the, the either the smaller sawgrass with the extra tray or the Epson Echo Tank really is the most economical way to go. Are you wondering which one I've decided on? I'm going to go with the Echo Tank because of the cost of replacement ink. That's, that's the whole thing there. I would love to have the sawgrass design element, but I think I can do what I need to do without that. And so that's what I'm going to do. And when I get that, I'm still kind of working up to that. When I get that, I'll make sure that I share that with you and how I'm setting it up and the results of, of my sublimating. Okay, so there you go. That's the science of sublimation. I hope you understand better now how sublimation works. If you're a homeschool family, I hope you'll try some of these. I will uh, list down below in the comments uh, where to get these basic blanks for uh, bookmarks. Real fun way to start. And you can do that with your household iron. You can watch my video about that. You can use your household iron and one box of of Cricut infusible ink and you have a science lesson ready for you. Now for those of you who stayed to the end, I told you I'd tell you something goofy that I've done in the lab. So I was in college and I was actually working in some marine biology labs up uh, in, the, in the Puget Sound in that whole area at Friday Harbor. And so we had these big tanks where we would put sea animals in there and we could, you know, study them, take their temperature, do all kinds of things. And uh, we kept them alive. <laughs> And so I had been studying about sea cucumbers and they do the most fascinating thing. Sea cucumbers as a protection mechanism, if they are being attacked by a predator, they will actually eviscerate their own guts. Basically what that means is they're throwing up their own innards <laughs> and then the predator will come and eat the, those innards and the sea cucumber has a really tough outer skin. And so the predator won't eat that part of it. And so the sea cucumber will eviscerate just enough of its guts, its innards to sustain life. So it'll retain within it enough to sustain life. So the predator will eat away those guts. And when they're gone, uh, the sea cucumber will suck in whatever's left and then regenerate their guts. Isn't that amazing? So <laughs> I was so fascinated by this. So I wanted to see a sea cucumber eviscerate. There I was with a sea cucumber in the, in the big tank. I tried everything to get that thing to eviscerate. We stood around the tank, we shook the tank, we uh, yelled at it, we fiddled with the water, we did everything we could think of and we could not get that thing to eviscerate until we took a Pycnopodia, which is a multi-rayed sea star. We took it out of one tank and put it in the tank with the sea cucumber. It eviscerated. It was so amazing to watch. It was fascinating. And then we took the Pycnopodia back out and put it in its tank and we watched and it took a while, but we watched as that sea cucumber pulled its innards back in and stayed alive. It was amazing. <laughs> Nature is fascinating. It's wonderful and amazing. And I hope you look for fun things around, things that will surprise and amaze and fascinate you. I will make sure I put in the comments section the product, products I've used, particularly the sublimation blanks that I've used that are highly successful and uh, you can uh, click on those links and purchase those and kind of up your game with your crafting and your sublimation. I hope you'll subscribe to the channel and that you'll enjoy learning and experimenting and doing really fun things with your crafting. See you next time.